This is um, a seminar on the question of cross-examination. In this uh, examination, uh, in this uh, discussion on, on the seminar, I will be relating the key issues that uh, one needs to learn from the point of view of the cross-examination. So cross-examination skills can be utilized in two different places. One of them is in a trial. It can be a small claims court or a superior court. It can also be used in the examination for discovery that uh, many of you may go through. And I'm presenting this seminar on behalf of the Angel Mentorship Group, <clears throat> where I'm a mentor where we do this program regularly on Wednesdays around noon, and those interested can share and attend the seminar by using the link and joining us here. My background is that I'm a lawyer in England, India, and Canada, and I practice mostly in Canada. And what I'm saying today will be based on essentially what we do in the Canadian jurisdiction, that is Ontario jurisdiction. <clears throat> I was a deputy judge for 24 years and had the opportunity <clears throat> to observe a number of lawyers, which enabled me to see the techniques and, and learn how the various lawyers use the skill for the purpose of uh, obtaining the answers they wish to obtain to make their case more uh, kind of, uh, capable of uh, getting the decision in their favor. So we'll start basically by explaining what the core skill is. This skill incidentally is not taught in uh, the by admission course or the JD program. And most lawyers who launch the practices are uh, left to their own devices to figure the skill out. If you're in a large firm, you're able to get some practice if you're in the litigation department. And if you're a smaller firm, then once in a while you end up going there and be able to participate in the examination for discovery. And if you get more practice, you'll end up going to trial. If you're a paralegal, there are more opportunities to go in a small claims court where the skill is very fundamental to carrying out your, your task. So I'm going to talk in terms of the way you prepare for the examination for discovery and uh, how do you utilize the, the skill of cross-examination when it comes to preparing for it. So just dealing with the question of the examiner's office, you need to locate in your area an examiner. These examiners are appointed by the um, by the government and have a license and have a training to transcribe the question and the answers that you will have in examinations. You get an appointment on a special form which you obtain from their offices. The, so the, you serve this notice of appointment to the person that you wish to examine. If there's a lawyer on the other side, you send them a copy of the notice and they attend on the appointed date. And uh, there are a number of examiners in Toronto, and there are more examiners in smaller towns as well. And once you have the appointment made and you appear there, you commence the examination in terms of the, <clears throat> the questions that you're going to ask. So in the way you ask the questions, it is my view that to prepare for it is extremely important. How do you prepare for it is the following. You take the main issues that you're dealing with. And in this particular case, I just want to illustrate one particular case that we managed to, to deal with recently. And uh, in this particular case, it was a person who was uh, is essentially giving the um, several checks to somebody thinking that this person will invest the money in a property or provide security for that money, but that never came about. And the action was commenced for the purpose of trying to recover the money. So in this kind of a case, you have an affidavit of documents which you have prepared on both sides and the appropriate time for the examination 
is the time when both the parties have agreed, and it's important to try that uh, the, the plaintiff and the defendant examine them within the same day or the second day uh, after the examination of the opposing side. So once you have the date set up and you have the affidavit of documents, and you have the idea of the evidence that you will be able to present, it is important to try and uh, basically prepare for it by the preparation of the questions that you do in advance. So you take the cluster of, of different events and ask questions based on the events that you want to, to bring forward in the examination. So for example, if a person had prepared a check or a person prepared a loan document or any other document in the, for the purpose of trying to bring evidence to the court in terms of what is it that the parties was getting the other person to sign, that these documents should be ready for you in the examination and they can be marked as the exhibits and around which you can examine. So when you commence the examination, it is my view that it is important to keep the question open-ended in the beginning. So for example, if there's a lending situation, um, you do not jump straight to the idea, did you write this check? The way to cross-examine is that you try to basically fish for the information that you can possibly get. So if the opponent is a <clears throat> defendant and your client is a person who lent the money, then you start the examination by saying that, how did you get to know this particular uh, witness? And then when you reach that particular point of uh, finishing the identity and finding out the person's name, their uh, birth of date, their profession, their address, etc. then you reach the point where you can pinpoint the questions that uh, can be asked to that witness. So you start by asking the question, uh, open-ended question first to get the information you could possibly get, such as, how did you know the person? Well, I met the person at this occasion. And and you can ask more questions based on the answers that you obtain from that witness. And then once you identify the relationship, then you begin the second question that did this, did the plaintiff ask for any kind of advice from you? Did you provide any documents? And if so, what document did you, did you ask the the plaintiff to sign. In this particular case, um, the money was borrowed and, and the document that was prepared was, a, was an agreement of shareholders. And, uh, and then this is an example of, firstly, you, you find out what did the person intend to do with the plaintiff in terms of documentation. So suppose there was a promissory note, suppose there was a check, and suppose there was a um, shareholders agreement. In each situation, you have, as the lawyer, already uh, available to you the information on the documents that you will have for trial or to prove your position. So you start with the open question, what document did you ask the witness plaintiff or the plaintiff to, to sign. So the person may say, okay, I prepared a shareholders agreement. So as soon as he says that, and you are in your mind sure that there was an agreement, then you ask more questions. If there was no shareholders agreement, then of course you say, well, do you, can you provide a copy of the shareholders agreement? Do you have a copy of it? If he says, yes, I will provide it, then, is it with you today? If he provides it, then you mark it as an exhibit. If he doesn't provide it, you get an undertaking. An undertaking is a statement usually given by the witness to say that I will provide the document 
at some other point in time. And if you do get that undertaking, it is very important that you have a, an understanding that how long it will take to provide the documentation because it's very important in litigation that you do not uh, have a situation that uh, the other person promises to do something and you do not have that document and that it lingers on and you do nothing about it. So there's always in litigation, you should have a checklist. So if the document is not produced, um, you get the undertaking and the undertaking should be defined very carefully. The way to define it is that if there was some kind of discussion between the parties, then at the end of the discussion, you repeat the question and say the following. Mr. So-and-so, did you agree to provide this documentation? And the documentation is the shareholders agreement or a promissory note or a check, for example. So identify the documentation that he has promised to produce. <clears throat> then you keep a handwritten note, if you can, also yourself of all these types of undertakings that you've obtained in the examination so that after the examination, um, you should make sure that there is a time limit in which they are going to produce these documents to you. And, uh, and if it is possible, you simply write a letter to the other party and if the lawyer is there on the other side, then you write to him and list all the documentation that they promised to be provided. And you remind them that you're looking for them in so many days time. So that's an example of the undertaking, an example of also the cross-examination in which you try to identify the document and ascertain which particular document is it that the other party asked. Now, if the transaction was marginal as it was in this particular case, then you have a chance to to sort of cross-examine. How do you cross-examine in this situation? For example, there was a shareholders agreement. So you ask the question, uh, you presented to the plaintiff a shareholders agreement. Was it your intention to make the plaintiff a shareholder? Now this will make the other person think very much and the other lawyer may intervene and say, well, this question is uh, not relevant, suppose you say that. So you have to just respond back and, and identify the statement of claim and the issues that the parties have, the pleadings that are going to be debated in the court and the issues that will be brought out based on the pleadings. So you can bring across the issue, for example, that the plaintiff claims that the sum of, uh, $100,000, for example, was taken from the plaintiff, which was never returned, and the claim arises out of the fact of not returning the amount of money. So now when you have, for example, a shareholders agreement, which is produced or described by the defendant, and then your question then is, what was your intention when you produced that statement of uh, uh, shareholders agreement? So the witness might say, well, I intended to make the person a shareholder. So you can follow up that question by saying immediately that did you then make that person a shareholder? No, I, for example, the answer is no. Then the question was that why did you not do it? But well, then he has to find some other answer. If the transaction was legitimate, then he would say, okay, I uh, had to go to the lawyer and ask him to do that. If, if he didn't go to the lawyer, then the question would be, um, who drafted the shareholders agreement? He might say, well, I drafted it. Are you a lawyer? No. Did you go to a lawyer? No. So you prepared this agreement yourself. You, so I think if you want to put pressure on the other side, you can point out, to him that he is just a witness, not a lawyer, but try to prepare a shareholders agreement. And therefore he was trying to do something which was legal. And then if you want to put pressure on him, you can say, okay, well, do you realize that to try to hold yourself out as a lawyer is inappropriate and can be an offense if you're trying to create uh, the appearance to other people that you're acting as a lawyer. 
So there are many pressure points that you can use to try to either embarrass the other witness or you can try to show that he's not necessarily telling all the truth the way it should come out in terms of the, the facts that you want to bring across and on record in the, in the transcript. Just for information, if you've not done this before, it's want to point out that all the examiners are usually trained. They usually use a mouthpiece that sits on the mouth and or sometimes they have a typewriter kind of an equipment on which they typewrite every question and every answer. And uh, they're responsible to transcribe and take down the question as well as the answers. And then at the end of the examination, you can ask them to prepare a, a, what's called a transcript in which they will point out on the first page the plaintiff's lawyer, the defendant's lawyer, and, uh, and you can buy the transcript and the person requested requesting the transcript must pay, I think it's about $2 or something per page. So it, uh, you have to be very careful that you do not drag out the, the examination too long. And uh, because the too many pages will be spent and it'll cost your client a lot of disbursements to have the transcript prepared. But, but the fact that uh, you prepared and you know what exactly you want and if you are skillful and know how to ask the questions, you will minimize the number of questions you have asked. And uh, one word of advice in terms of the question that you ask is that it should be very pinpointed. So the thinking process of what is the issue and what is it the answer that you want should happen in your mind. So by the time you frame the question, it comes across in a very simplified, straightforward manner and that is the skill of the lawyer in terms of how to do the cross-examination. So if you do not have that skill of cross-examination, then very often it will come across as examination in chief. In other words, you ask the question and lead the witness on to the next event that happened, which is what you can do in examinations for discovery or, or in, a, in, a, in a first examination of the witness. Um, but the cross-examination is different. It is different in the sense that you are analyzing the fact from your point of view and eliciting the answer that you want to obtain. And you can ask question again in different ways until you get that particular answer. But it's important to point out that you do not need the admission of the responsibility directly in those words that you want the other person to provide. And the reason for that is that when the, there are two sides to the, to the system, that is the plaintiff and the defendant, we are in an adversarial system where each lawyer is representing their own particular client and, and seeing the evidence and the facts from their own point of view. So there is a, a difference of opinion in every trial in the way you perceive the law and the facts. And therefore, when you cross-examine, you will find that there is a difference and your approach will be different than the opposing party's approach. But it's important to recognize and remember that when you frame the question, it is not only a question, but the judge, when he reads the transcript, he will also understand that your point of view or what perspective that you have is illustrated by the way you ask the question. For example, when you ask the question, that did you ask the plaintiff to sign this document? And was the shareholder's agreement intended for the purpose of getting some shares in the hands of the plaintiff? So I think that if there was no intention, then the person had fraudulent, fraudulent intention that some legal looking document was presented to the plaintiff, which the plaintiff was asked to sign, and therefore you are indirectly by framing the question indicating that the person asking the document to be signed did not have a proper intention to get the genuine document to be signed. So that should be elicited in the way you ask the questions from the witness on the other side. So one of the problems of uh, examinations is in the adversarial system, then you have a witness that you're going to examine or cross-examine. 
but that his lawyer will also be present in that meeting. So one thing that I should point out is that very often the lawyers in the adversarial system create some kind of uh, hostility or questioning and, and even test out the lawyer. And in particular, actually, my experience in my younger days was that they test out and think out how far you are familiar with the proceedings. So if you're new to the whole uh, the uh, questioning system and the way that the examination works, then he will test you in the beginning. Say, for example, they raise an objection to you, what I object. So if he objects, you should know how to frame the question and uh, let the person understand that let the person understand that you are uh, responding from the question point of view but you're the person asking questions and therefore you are not there to answer the questions as a lawyer you're there to ask the questions so i think when you have a confrontation of that kind with the other lawyer you should politely let him know that you the person that day asking questions and you would like to ask the questions and then if there is a, a questioning then by the other lawyer that you're not relevant, then you can point out the relevance to the other person. Then this is why you can proceed on the basis of what is relevant in that issue. And therefore you are uh, entitled to ask the question. Now, if the disagreement is there further, you can also um, make a notation of the disagreement and frame the question at the end so that this question can then be addressed to the judge in a motion to compel the answers to that question. And if the answer is not forthcoming, you can ask the judge in the motion that the particular pleading, if you're acting for the plaintiff, that the pleading defense should be struck out. So if you are a plaintiff's lawyer and asking for the particulars of a, a, an undertaking to be fulfilled, or a question to be asked to be compelled to be answered by the other party because the other party says it's not relevant, then your motion will say that you're looking for a default judgment and looking for, for you to strike out the defense uh, because it does not provide the answer. When you frame the question, the question was not answered and therefore you're asking the judge to strike out the defense or make an amendment. The judge might make a compromise and say, I'll permit the other person to amend and you may continue the examination. So coming back to the examination, it's very important to recognize that you do not conclude the examination. If you conclude the examination, your right to continue the examination is exhausted. So you cannot conduct several examinations, only one. Therefore, when you do not have the answer and you wish to continue the examination, you should, at the end of the, the session, you should say that this uh, hearing is adjourned, that you'll be notified that the examination will continue at another point in time, and this question will be framed again, or a motion will be brought, and if the motion decision of the judge is to compel you to answer the question, you can then ask the question again at the adjourned subsequent hearing and get the particular answer that you want. So the types of objections that you typically get in an examination of discovery are that the issue is not relevant. Suppose the other lawyer says that. Then you have to show the relevance and you show it on the transcript so that when the judge reads the transcript, you're able to show that you were not what is called fishing for information on irrelevant issues. Just a general uh, point that I should make a comment on here is the fact that uh, when you ask questions on the assets of the defendant, they don't have an obligation to provide the list of all the assets until you have a judgment. In the judgments on this examination, you can ask those questions in which they have to disclose all the information of what the, uh, what the assets are, but not before the, the decision is, uh, a judgment is made. So I think these are some of the issues that you have to keep in mind when you're dealing with the examination for discovery. So what are, but this, the, the teaching system in the bioadmission notes do not give you all this detail. So 
It is better to attend one or two examinations, or if you would like to join our group, uh, we will help you prepare the examinations. And, uh, and this is the reason for this kind of seminars. So the second other type of uh, objection may be that you're supposed to come with the documents in the examination. But if you came without a document and then you ask for the document, for example, a financial statement that is relevant to illustrate the particular point, um, then you can ask, well, can you provide the financial statement that will show that this check was cashed, was not cashed, or that this particular statement shows that your position of the money in the company was a certain position on this particular date. So if the documents are not brought to you, then you can ask the other person to provide an undertaking that that document will be provided. But very often, if you are prepared, what will happen is that there'll be your affidavit of documents and the affidavit of documents of the other party as well. So you have this documentation with disclosure of the documents under the affidavit of the documents, which will enable you to know, broadly speaking, what documents each party has and based on which you will be conducting the examination. So in the examination, of course, if a document is relevant to be brought across, then you can ask the question uh, again to make sure that the undertaking is understood, recorded, and reminded by a letter from you. So it's produced. It's not produced, then you can bring a motion to, to compel that to be, to be provided. But now in terms of the objection, this kind of an event that is not finished off in the examination can be relevant to be continued later on after the examination. So you should have a, a, your checklist of the file that tells you that you're waiting for some documents, waiting for some answers, and you wrote a letter to them, and your uh, reminder system gives you the information that, that was not provided, and therefore you have to do something about it. As the general guidance to the litigation lawyers, I would strongly recommend that the tendency for many lawyers is to wait for the last few days before something is done because you're busy and therefore you didn't have the time to do it. But if you discipline yourself in terms of organization, you would have something that is happening a month ahead prepared for. You take a little bit at a time and you prepare the questions, you prepare the next step and and then deal with the matter a little bit at a time so that you're not overwhelmed. So you should have a daily agenda for a litigation lawyer or any other type of a area of law that you're practicing to make sure that each file in terms of what you need to do is dealt with by a reminder system. And litigation is particularly important because if you're not coming prepared for the examination or any other event, then the judge will sense it and then we will not be very sympathetic with you. So I think that uh, in terms of the cross-examination, I mentioned to you how questions can be put, undertaken, given. And when you start the examination, just to summarize again, you should have an open-ended question, but when you do have a specific answer, you should be ready with both the alternative answers. If he says yes, what are you gonna say next? If he says no, then what is it that uh, the next question would arise? But very often, some question will arise that has not been uh, discussed, disclosed, or, or narrated to you. And you need to know the position of the other party. And the purpose of cross-examination is to ensure that this particular issue that uh, is uh, brought across is understood by you from your point of view. And you can bring it across in the trial. And in the trial, if the evidence given it, it contradicts with what has been said in the examinations, and you can cross-examine even in the trial to say that in the examination, this is the statement that you made. So it's very important that you prepare and you have a transcript with you, and both for the trial or for the examinations, you should carry some kind of a folder or a binder in which you have all the documents listed, the documents you're going to mark as an exhibit, and then at the trial, you can refer to this, these documents and say that uh, here is the document that you were shown in the examination. Here was your answer. And what is your position today? So um, in terms of the 
examination and the trial, the cross-examination and the whole process of the trial is not really taught in the biomission of the GD program. So a lot of the learning will take place when you start uh, legal practice. Now, if you're doing very limited amount of litigation, then you may have one case today, another case uh, a month from now or next month, and you may not get sufficient amount of experience. So it's very important that in the beginning, first, if you go there for the first time, that you talk to a colleague or join a mentorship group so that you can ask the questions and prepare yourself uh, mentally and, and in terms of documents well before you, you go to that uh, hearing. Um, I think in terms of the uh, smoke lamp score, the cross-examination technique is also very important actually in terms of the, the relevance of the issue. If you have mastered the facts in your mind and you have kept the categories clear in your mind, you will be able to address the issue much better than if you were not uh, prepared actually. So I think that the way to prepare for the cross-examination at the trial, um, much more than at the examination, examination of discovery is that by the time you dealt with the case, you dealt with all the facts and the law and researched the law, and you are re ready now to, to frame the questions to the witness, and you make your submissions in the opening of the trial, and you make your submissions at the end, but in between when you have a right to cross-examine the witness, the facts and the law should be clear in your mind so that you're able to pinpoint the issue that you want to bring across. So if the critical answer, it is there, then you have to remember what the answer was of the witness because you'll be using that information to try to make your summary of the judgment in terms of what is the witness said that uh, was critical to your position in the, in the whole set of facts and that why that, that critical fact was given and the answer given a certain way is then narrated to the judge in your submission at the end of a trial. So I hope that was helpful. And uh, I noticed that Naman is there. So Naman, if you have any questions, you can ask, otherwise we'll close the session here. No, Mr. J, I'm good. Okay, thank you for being here today and I'm closing this session and uh, then, then, then it'll be again for those who are not present today in the Facebook, you can join the Facebook at Angel Mentorship Group and watch some of these programs. And uh, if you are interested to work with us, write a message to me and we'll bring you on to the seminar or help you answer any question that you have based on this kind of a seminar in which you would address the question, you can frame the question and we'll address it for you. Thank you.